In this video, we're going to discuss rotational kinetic energy. It's the energy associated with objects that are spinning. So to think about this, I want you guys to consider the situation in the diagram below. Let's imagine that we just have a single bicycle tire wheel and it can spin or rotate about its center. And imagine you can hang on to something at the pivot point so you can get this thing spinning faster and faster and faster while it's staying stationary. So at this position it has no translational velocity. If this thing were spinning and had some initial angular velocity and you just dropped it, it's going to start it's going to basically speed up and start rolling to the right across the floor and so at some later time in some later position it's going to be moving at some translational velocity it's going to be its center of mass will be moving from through space and it's going to still have some angular velocity but probably some smaller angular velocity well how do we make an energy bar graph for this situation well if we consider the system to be just the wheel uh, we, it's clear that at position B it has some kinetic energy. It has some translational kinetic energy. If it's just a wheel and the Earth isn't included in the system, there can't be any gravitational potential energy. There's no springs going on. And let's assume that there's no significant increases in thermal energy. So what's going on? Well, there's translational kinetic energy at position B. At position A, there is no translational kinetic energy because its center of mass isn't moving through space. It's being held at rest while rotating about its pivot point. Well, does that mean that wheel doesn't have any kinetic energy? Well, it's not moving through space, so it doesn't have any translational kinetic energy. But think about this. The tire and, and all the wheel is rotating, and each little piece of the tire is moving tangential to the pivot point. And so we'd say that each little point in the tire has kinetic energy because each point is actually moving through space. It's moving uh, all around that pivot point. So we can't say that it has translational kinetic energy, but what we can say is that the tire has rotational kinetic energy due to the individual kinetic energies of all of the individual pieces of that object that are moving through space just around a pivot point. And so we're going to just define uh, something new. We're going to call it total kinetic energy. It's the sum of the translational kinetic energy an object, object has and the rotational kinetic energy an object has. And so if we look to our energy bar chart, we have a new energy storage account. An object can have both translational kinetic energy and it, in a separate energy account it can store rotational kinetic energy. So if we look at position B, it is spinning, and so this object will have some rotational kinetic energy. So at position B, the wheel has both translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. If the sum of those two things is four bars, that means there must be four bars of energy over here, and the energy at position A is stored as rotational kinetic energy. So we'd put four bars under the rotational kinetic energy account. So our energy conservation equation then becomes for the wheel that the rotational kinetic energy at position A in the beginning has to be equal to the translational kinetic energy that the wheel has at position B plus the rotational kinetic energy of the wheel at position B. So let's see if we can derive an equation for how much kinetic energy is stored as rotational uh, energy if we know, for instance, the mass of the object that's spinning and its angular velocity. Let's simplify things a little bit and just imagine, let's say, for our bicycle tire at position A that's being held at the pivot point, let's imagine that all of the mass of that tire is located at some radial distance. So all the little spokes and everything will assume our negligible mass and all of it is moving at that radial distance. And let's assume that it's spinning at a constant angular velocity and so each little bit of each little piece of mass will be moving at the same tangential velocity as this thing spins. Well, how could we figure out the kinetic energy of like all of the mass moving at that radial distance? Well, remember our translational kinetic energy equation is one half mv squared. So all that mass is moving at a radial distance how do we figure out 
what the velocity is? Well, let's put that in terms of our angular velocity. So let's turn our velocity term, v, into omega for angular velocity. Remember that to go back and forth between linear velocity and angular velocity, we can use this expression right here. That v is equal to r times omega, or the translational speed, or velocity, in this case the tangential speed, is equal to the radial distance times the angular velocity. In this equation, since we have a v squared, let's square everything inside of here so we get v squared is equal to r squared times omega squared. So our kinetic energy equation, finding out the translational kinetic energy of all of the object moving in a circle, is 1 half times the mass times r squared times omega squared, because this is substituted in for velocity squared. Let's group the m and the r squared together and leave the omega squared out. So we get 1 half times m times r squared times omega squared. Well, let's think about what are the units of these variables in parentheses. We have a mass times a radial distance squared. So we'd have units of kilogram times meter squared. Now, we've seen those units before. What are those the units for? Those are the units for rotational inertia. So it turns out that if the mass is, all of the mass that's rotating is at a common radial distance, you can actually calculate the rotational inertia of a spinning object by taking the total mass times the radial distance squared. So this right here, in this case, is the rotational inertia. And so let's just put a capital I in for that. So this equation turns out to be the kinetic energy associated with mass that's spinning is equal to 1 half times the rotational inertia of that thing times its angular velocity squared. So now we have an equation to calculate exactly how many joules of energy are stored for any spinning object as long as we know its rotational inertia and its angular velocity. This is on your AP Physics 1 equation sheet. We just talked about the fact that if all of the mass of a spinning object is at a the same radial distance, in this case, let's say a thin ring or a hollow cylinder, like, a, like our idealized bicycle tire, then the rotational inertia is found by taking the total mass times the radial distance squared, or I equals M times R squared. Turns out that things are a little bit more complicated if not all of the mass is located at the same distance from the point about which the object is rotating. Take, for instance, a thin rod that's rotating about a, its center right here. Uh, not all of its mass is at the same distance. Some of the mass that's spinning is far out, some of it's closer to the center, and some of the mass is at the pivot point. And so it turns out that to calculate the rotational inertia of something like this, it's not mr squared or m times r squared, it's 1 12th times the total mass times the total length of this rod squared. And for different geometric shapes and different pivot point locations, you would calculate the rotational inertia differently. The good news is that you guys don't have to do this calculation. The equation would be given for you if you guys needed to use it on a problem. So let's look at one sample AP question together dealing with the idea of rotational kinetic energy. So two objects are released from rest at the top of ramps with the same dimensions as shown in the figure above. The sphere rolls down one ramp without slipping. The small block slides down the other ramp without friction. The question is, which object reaches the bottom of its ramp first and why? If you look at all of the answer choices, they're dealing with energy in some way. So to answer this question, let's go back and make an energy bar graph, one for the block and one for the sphere. So let's do it for the block first. Um, at the top of the ramp, the block and the earth will have gravitational potential energy stored. Let's just say that there's four bars. By the time the block slides down the ramp, it says without friction, so there's no thermal energy increases. When it gets down to the bottom of the ramp, let's call that a height of zero, all of its energy will be transferred to translational kinetic energy. 
like this. Well, what about the sphere? If the ramps are all the same dimensions, that, and let's assume that the, the sphere is the same mass as the block, that means it's going to start with the same amount of gravitational potential energy as the block does. But if this thing is rolling without slipping, that means by the time it gets, gets down to the bottom, it will be moving translationally. It will be moving through space. It will have a speed. And it will be rotating. So that means in the end, it's going to have some translational kinetic energy and some rotational kinetic energy. So let's think about the implications. Which one of these objects will be moving faster through space? Which one will have a greater translational velocity or a greater translational speed? Well, it's got to be the object with the most translational kinetic energy. That is for the block right here. And so if the block will reach the bottom with a greater speed than the sphere, that must mean it had a greater acceleration. If it had a greater acceleration and reaches a greater speed, that must mean it's going to take less time for that to get to the bottom of the ramp than the sphere. And so that means the block has to be the one that reaches the ramp at the bottom. So it has to be choices C or D. And so the question is, well, what's the correct reason for that? Well, it's because it's going to, going to be choice D, the block. Because the block does not gain rotational kinetic energy, but the sphere does. Since the sphere gains rotational kinetic energy, there's less energy in the end for it to be stored translationally as kinetic energy, so it's going to be moving slower.